This is CouncilCast, part of the Legal Talk Network, and I'm your host, Karen Conroy. When you face a complex case outside your expertise, you bring in a co-counsel for next-level results. When you want to engage, expand, and elevate your firm, you bring in a marketing co-counsel. In this podcast, I bring in marketing experts who each answer one big question to help your firm achieve more. Here's today's guest. Hi, I'm Eli Schwartz, growth advisor, author of Product Led SEO. I work with companies to understand how they should understand SEO and how they should build efforts and strategies to achieve that goal. Really excited to be here and talk about whether people should be doing SEO and the kinds of SEO they should be doing. And really looking forward to this discussion. So thank you so much for having me, Karen. Thank you, Eli. I'm I'm really looking forward to this too, because I know you've got a really unique approach to this. I feel like um, there is kind of a mainstream uh, strategy and thought process for SEO. And uh, just in the little bit that we've been, uh, that I've kind of looked into your details and your book um, and what we've been talking about, it's a really different approach and it makes so much sense. So uh, we're going to be talking about SEO, which is one of our most desired and popular topics, not just for our audience, but you know, in general, for some reason, it just seems like this sort of magic uh, I'm, I'm picturing a crystal ball, sort of one of those like mysterious crystal balls that a lot of people feel is their golden ticket. So I want to talk about all of that and um, why your approach is different and your thoughts and your strategy. But the big question that we're going to talk about today is where does most SEO go wrong? And so thank you for being here to begin with. And, and I'm looking forward to this conversation as well. But Eli, tell us where do you think, uh, just kind of big picture, what is the first thing that most firms are doing wrong with their SEO? So it's interesting. It's an interesting question, which is, I don't think people should be doing SEO. Because, like, for example, if you would think of other marketing channels, SEO is a, it's a marketing channel. Yes. You're not going to tell someone who's focused on the New York audience or New York market that they need to take out a billboard in LA. Yes. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So when it comes to SEO, it's the same idea. If there is a, a wide understanding of, I need to do this because this is going to generate business for me. There are people looking for me or for the services I have to offer on a search engine. And therefore they're going to find me and this is beneficial investment. Then I wouldn't do it. And I, I think the f- biggest misunderstanding about SEO is how does it work? What am I getting out of it? Yes. Now I know that there are going to be some law firms that can really point to like, no, all of these clients came in the door because they were looking for us and this is a great channel for us. But a lot of firms are not going to know that. And they're paying either a full-time employee or an agency or some other sort of uh, you know extortionist company <laughs> to do some SEO for them yeah. because they think they have to yes. and you don't have to. The same way the pandemic taught us, you don't have to be in the office to be successful. Yeah. You don't actually have to do SEO. Like stop SEO, see what happens. Yes. I think that is uh, that is going to be a very huge light bulb moment for, I think, a lot of the audience where um, – and. I feel like I saw some of this too in the beginning of the internet when everyone was just getting a website or a presence and everyone was copying everyone else, especially in the legal industry. There were like three websites out there and everybody just kept copying everybody else. And and I still get clients to this day that their sole strategy is, well, Bob down the street is doing this. So, uh, you know, shrug, you know, maybe I should be doing this too. So, so let's dig into that more. Why why should certain firms not be doing it? Why is it a mismatch for certain types of firms? It really depends on the audience. And what I would say is it depends on what you're focusing on. So I'll use myself as an example. I was I was looking into getting a trademark on on something that I'd written. So I didn't use the internet to find that because the internet, it's too big. Yeah. But if I look for information about trademarks, I'm going to find official government resources. And if I would have found a law firm that clarified the questions I had, that law firm might have not been near me or in the area of practice I needed. So that wasn't going to generate any conversions for me. The path I chose was referral. I went to my friends, that's who they knew, and that's how I got connected to the right lawyer. When it comes to other things, let's say uh, it's personal injury. Yeah. I know in the personal injury space, there's a lot of advertising, and that is what drives 
phone calls and emails and whatever, however else these clients are generating. People aren't necessarily going onto Google and saying, I've just been injured. Let me see who comes up first, and then I'm going to call them. Again, it comes down to the path of acquisition for that client. And if SEO is not part of that path of acquisition, I wouldn't invest any dollars in it, hardly any dollars. You could do a little bit. You want to make sure you're found. The other thing that I think is really important is how you position yourself. So say it's, um, it's, it's a patent it's something around patents and I'm Googling and I land on a web page and the web page just has a picture of smiling lawyers. <laughs> is that something that's going to make me email them or call them? Probably not. Right. I'm looking for some level of expertise. I'm looking for past history if they're able to disclose that, that they've done something in my space. So again, I, web designers will be very focused on design. That may be boring. That may be a website that looks like Craigslist, but just a list of past things that they've done, yeah. which informs me that they're good at what they're doing and I should talk to them. But then again, the website might be really well designed and have a picture of the office and the smiling lawyers at the desk. So it all comes down to the audience. And this is a path of acquisition. And if it's not a path of acquisition, why bother? Right. I like, I like this idea um, of focusing on SEO as one of your marketing channels. And we will get a lot of uh, initial inquiry calls where that is 90% of the conversation. And that's where they lead. That's where they, you know, that's all they really want to talk about in terms of the, the work that they think needs to be done. And for us, that's a red flag. I mean, clearly it's important. But it's not the end all for an entire marketing strategy. So what, what would you say to those people who are overly focused on the SEO and they feel like those measurements, first of all, they're watching those measurements every single month and they're looking at those reports and they're looking at, you know, it, it's, it's to me similar to watching your stocks, you know, and kind of watching the drops and the dips and the rises like from one cent to the next. Um, why is that not <laughs> the right kind of approach to managing your marketing campaigns? So if my measurements are referring to rankings on search, that's not something you should be watching at all because that is not business. I, I've worked with clients and I've had past jobs where they're very focused on how they were visible on search. They want to be visible on, one, on a certain word. Yeah. But if no one looks for that word and no one clicks on that word, and if they do click on that word, they don't convert in this case to a phone call or email, it doesn't really matter. So I wouldn't even put all that effort in. I would focus on this as a holistic channel. So I'm sure that many of the listeners do paid marketing, whether that's on Facebook or whether that's on Google using keywords. Yeah. No one will put as a goal, oh, I spent a million dollars this month. That's, I'm successful. I spent a million dollars this month on, on advertising. But no one put as a goal, no matter what you search, you're going to find me. That doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So when it comes to SEO, you should have similarly tight goals of I am visible for this work because I know for sure it makes my phone ring and focus on those metrics. And if I, a, a pushback people will, will give me or maybe will give you is, well, I, I don't know. I don't know if that's working. That's not an excuse. Yeah. Go find out. Find out if this channel is working. So just like that example I gave earlier of like, don't take out a billboard in LA if your market is New York. Don't be doing SEO. If that's not working. You need to understand this. This is money out of your pocket. In many cases, people are, again, either have a full-time employee who they're paying anywhere from thirty dollars to $100,000 per year, or they have a firm, which is costing them. Uh, if it's cost less than $500, you're definitely being ripped off. Yeah. But a couple thousand dollars to tens of thousands of dollars per month, if this is not a channel that's breaking even, driving profit, don't invest in it. There are other places to put that money. So what would you say they should be paying attention to measurement wise? Uh, you know, and I, I have my answer, but um, what's what's the number one kind of metric and, and measurement that they should, and, and they maybe don't even necessarily have a report for it, but they just kind of know in their gut. I wouldn't know in your gut. I would really bring that to one extra level of knowing for sure. Okay. So for example, in my own business, I'm a consultant and I work by myself and I don't have any employees. Every, th every inbound email or phone call, oh, only th no phone calls, inbound email yeah. <laughs> that I get and I turn it into a phone call, I always ask them how they found yes. it. Yes. And they may say, hey, I heard you on a podcast. Right. Or I heard you, I saw a conference presentation did or I, I bought your book. That tells me where I should be investing. I think that for most firms, even if, unless they're massive and they get so much inbound that no one's having a conversation, they can go that extra step of like, well, how did, 
who can we thank right. for bringing you our web? Exactly. Was it an ad? Was it a search? Or was it a referral? Like you like to know those things. Yeah. And I think in many cases, if someone's going to say I searched, that may not be the best client because that's the person I know. Like when I do this, like I said, I was looking for a locksmith a couple weeks ago. I searched and I called all ten people. Right. So they're, they're just price shopping. Right. Is that so? Yes, you're visible. You do what you can to be visible. But how much effort are you going to put in that? Yes. To be one of ten. Yeah, that's a great point because um, first of all, even if you are a massive firm, you should have an intake process, and part of that intake process needs to be knowing where these leads are coming from. If you're going to invest any amount of money in these marketing campaigns, you have to be able to measure them. So I, I don't I don't feel like any size firm, there's any excuse for not just asking that question, whether it's the person who's, you know, taking the call somewhere down the road or somewhere in that process, it's as important as getting their name and email. So, you know, that's just my two cents. I, I feel like you likely agree on that. But knowing also which of those avenues. So if they are answering that they just did the Google search and that, you know, for your firm is similar to what you're describing, those are going to be the tire kickers and the price, you know, price conscious, like not the great clients, knowing where those red flags are. So there was a coaching program that I did a while ago and they actually created, um, and this was for agencies. So obviously slightly different for a law firm, but they created a scorecard and it took the emotion out of kind of analyzing each lead. So you just have a simple, it was like, a, you know, three different questions does, uh, and I can't remember even what the questions are now because I can do it so quickly in my head and just know in my gut, is this, is this a good lead or are there some red flags here? Are they too price conscious? Are they, um, do they seem eager to work? Are they ready to work? You know, things like that. So kind of come up with your own questions as you're taking those leads and then rank them. And so that as you go through that process, you know whether it's something that you really want to invest a lot more marketing uh, time and effort into. So um, I kind of derailed that <laughs> that, that point, but... <laughs> no, I, I would agree with that. I, I'd say like, I have a lot of conversations with people about how they should be measuring their marketing. And I'd say in this case, it's easier to do. Yeah. So when someone's measuring their marketing by raw analytics data, it's hard to know yeah. what made them, what was the last thing they touched on the website. You need to really rely on your software and understand your website, understanding that. In this case, if you're actually having a conversation with a potential client, it's so much easier to just say, where did you hear about yeah. it? In an e-commerce case where you never have that conversation, they click, they fill out their information, they pay the credit card, and you ship it. And the best you could do is like, hey, how you found us? Come find us again. Right. That's different. In this case, you're always having that conversation. And if you've decided not to have the conversation, that may be the time when you try to figure out, well, analytics-wise, who are those people I don't even want to call them? Yes, exactly. So that's a great point. Um, going to the next question that I had was to talk kind of about content strategy. And I know that you talk a lot about creating um, questions and content around questions that really answers those answers the questions that your clients are are asking. And so, how is that different? And you know, what is the approach that you found that works in terms of of content? And if you're really um, recognizing that some of those metrics are going to be hard to track because maybe, especially for lawyers and law firms, maybe that that time from when they first hear about you to when they actually hire you is a while. You know, it may be a divorce attorney where initially, you know, it's six, eight months. They're thinking about a divorce and they don't actually pull the trigger until later. And so they're just slowly being dripped some information coming to your website a few times versus a DUI attorney where they are pulling up your website from the back of the car when they're leaving jail. <laughs> you know, so like it could be so different, the kind of information each firm is getting. So let's talk more about how that content can support that and um, how questions work. Yeah. So I love this question. And I love how specific you are with the kinds of attorneys. <laughs> so I'd say the big mistake, and this is all right. So we first biggest mistake people will make, and I, I know we have to get to that. Some people should be doing SEO. So I want to, I don't want to just like leave it out there. Like don't do SEO, bad idea. Yeah. Some people should, we'll get there. But Biggest mistake people make is doing SEO when they shouldn't be doing SEO. And the second thing I would say, the biggest mistake they make is doing the wrong kind of SEO. Okay. Which is if you are a divorce attorney 
and you serve a specific geographic area, and like you said earlier, people are very focused on their metrics, the metrics you want to focus on are only for your geographic area. If you're not going to take, if you're in Florida and you're not going to take a divorce in Texas, ranking number one for a divorce attorney in Texas does absolutely nothing for you. Right. So the metric you should be looking at is like, what is my ranking for, is not what is my ranking for divorce attorney. It should be divorce attorney in Miami, divorce attorney in Florida, divorce in St. Petersburg. Right? Those are the things you want to focus on. Content wise, it's the exact same thing. So instead of saying, Here's a piece of content. And a lot of times when people are doing SEO, they're focused that they're using keyword research tools, yeah. which tell them generic keywords. So I'm a divorce attorney. I'm going to go and put in divorce or maybe divorce law or divorce case. And then the, the, the tool will spit out a bunch of ideas. Most of those ideas, if you write towards them, are not specific to what you service. They're English specific. They're just specific to the English language. So focusing on those as your KPIs or what I'm going to shoot towards doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. So you really want to tailor your content towards the buyer. So the buyer is, if you're a divorce attorney in Miami, then you want to say, well, I am the best divorce attorney in Miami because I give free coffee in my office. <laughs> so you're coming in to speak to yeah. you. I'm the best divorce attorney in Miami because I'm well connected with all of these other service providers. I'm the best divorce attorney because I service this specific community that you're in. That's the content you write. So instead of thinking of, I want to write content because a keyword research told me, think of, I want to write content because my audience needs to understand that I am the best person at this. And when they arrive at my website, the content sells. And I think that's another thing people make mistake with on the internet in general, which is they think of websites as uh, like a store, just a, a place people drop into. Yes. But really, it, a website is this opportunity to sell them into do the next thing. Send me an email or call me. You don't walk into a Best Buy and they someone just starts screaming at you. Like, we, we have computers, we have TVs. They say, can I help you find something? Right? Like, that's the same idea. So, I just imagining like you're going into Best Buy and you want like a TV and then there's like just this guy screaming at you, computers, computers. Like, and, and you're like, what are you talking about with these computers? That is not even what I'm here for. And it's such a great visual because that is so what so many websites are doing wrong. So what's the right way of, what's the right way to, to do that? So I, I, I mean, I answer this question all the time, but I think it's so perfect for your audience specifically because they have conversations with customers, yes. in this case clients, right? So they understand. I, in many cases, like I have a client that are in the e-commerce space and luckily for them, they have physical stores. So they have salespeople that talk to actual customers and navigate them through a purchase, except the people I talk to are not those people. They're in the website. Yeah. So I keep saying, go to the store, yes. go sit in the store and watch how the salespeople explain the features. All the things you're dumping on your website are probably useless. So in this case with lawyers and paralegals and whoever's listening to this, that's actually driving the content production on the website, they have the conversations. They know when the light bulb moment goes off, when they're talking to a client physically in person, or on the phone when it says, oh, I, I like this. I would like to keep talking to you. Yeah. Or can you email me information or I'd like a contract? They know what makes them go there. Yeah. And that's what you should be putting on your website. Not like, I specialize in all this and I went to this school and like, again, the kinds of uh, smiling pictures of lawyers. Right. Like that is not what helps convince them that they need to take that next step. Yes, yeah. I think that's so valuable to recognize that you have those answers. And if you have been doing this for more than a week, you've already had these conversations. You already know what your clients are asking, hopefully, because uh, we just had another conversation on an episode, a recent episode where we were talking about consultation calls and where those go wrong. So hopefully you're asking the right kinds of questions so that you're letting those clients really uh, give you the the things that they care about and give and you know you're not leading that conversation and you know taking t making it about you you're making it about them because you have that's what's going to sell and what's going to convert and for the same thing for the same reasons on your website you have those same questions and just throw those questions that they are asking you and it shows your expertise. It shows that you've done this work before. It shows that you care about their problem. It does all the things that everybody says to do in your content. And you're not screaming computers at them when they walk into Best Buy and trying to sell them on something that they not, not only are not interested in, but it shows that you just are not paying attention and you're just not the right fit. 
So that's, that's, that's awesome. So what else? So, so coming back to the big question about where they go wrong, and you were saying earlier that you wanted to get to, you know, a lot of these firms should not be doing SEO at all because it's not aligned with their goals, but some should. So who, which are those firms that should be doing it? So the, the, the firms that should be doing SEO are the ones that understand that their clients come from search. So it's probably the kinds of things where people have a little bit more time to really think about who they want to contact. Yeah. The UI case in the back of the like, police car, yeah. probably not, right? <laughs> That's going to be like, who are my friends have, at a DUI and who do I contact? The same might be with, um, actually, the divorce turn is probably a great example. Yeah. That's where trickles of information are, it's helpful. Yeah. And you're building that sale. So if people are under time pressure, they're just, they're contacting friends. If they're gathering information, you, they, you can be that resource where they gather information. And again, I would be very focused, and this is how you would do SEO, not retain a, a firm that's going to create a bunch of useless content or retain a firm that's going to get you a bunch of links. And we'll talk about links in a second. Or retain a firm that's going to give you f- f- reports on how well you're doing on visibility on rankings. Rather, retain a firm that can help you write the content that you should technically be writing yourself and take what's in your head. So if you're a divorce attorney and you understand a specific community or you understand a specific use case where there's children or someone's travel, there's a, someone on a visa or um, a partner wants to move overseas or um, one partner is, is unemployed, like those specific things where you know you specialize in and then when you have those conversations, you win. Yeah. And you know, again, because you're having all these conversations, you know there are people out there that need your services, that's the SEO you do. Yeah. So you say like, it's divorce attorney for visa holders. That's the content, that's the keyword. There's not gonna be thousands of people, millions of people searching for that. Right. But the people that are searching for that, especially in your geographic area, you wanna be number one of that because that's what you do. That's how you do SEO. So now going back to how you should be doing that, get the firm that you wanna do that for you, the SEO firm that can do that for you, shouldn't be, oh, we're gonna produce 80 pieces of content per month, you only want those pieces of content that really help you sell. Yes. You could either do it yourself or they could help you with the website structure, but that's what you do, not just generic yeah. lawyer content, generic, generic legal content. Yeah, yeah, because what ends up happening with that generic content is, um, especially if it's super generic and just talking lawyer in general, is we've had clients where all of a sudden they're getting calls for a completely different uh, practice area. So the DUI attorney is getting divorce calls and it's a waste of time and money. And it literally, you could va- you know put a value on how many they are getting, you know, 60 extra calls that's taking this person that much time. And, you know, it's, and they're getting all these leads that some firm is calling them leads, but they really aren't because it's just poorly done SEO that is not narrowly targeted enough. So, uh, so you mentioned links. Why? Where does where do things go wrong with links? So, twenty three years ago or so, when Google came out, so there were many, many other search engines. And Google's innovation was that they were going to instead of ranking the web by alphabet, which is the way the first search engines <laughs> did, and then ranking the web by how many keywords you stuffed into your page. Initially, it was just one tag, and then the search engines tried to understand it, which is how the, the internet became known for adult kinds of things, which is you were a lawyer, but you stuffed your keywords full of adult terms because you were hoping that like someone would search those things and be like, oh, I totally was looking for a divorce <laughs> like, how'd you? That's why this website is showing up for those terms. <laughs> but what Google's innovation was, was they wanted to really have more of a holistic understanding of the web and web pages and later on what people were actually searching for by taking into account how things were linked. So Google was started in Stanford by PhD students who were using the academic method of the reason why Stanford is Stanford is because a lot of people say, well, that study came from Stanford, it must be legitimate. You don't very often hear, you know, the um, the provost of University of Phoenix was saying, you don't have that come up in conversation right. as often. And you don't and as often have people rec- uh, referencing studies that come out of community college, right. which is why Stanford, Stanford, Harvard, Harvard, and all that. So what Google tried to do is say, well, if something authoritative links to something else, it's lending that credibility. Yes. So that's where links come in. This entire thing was useful. And then, of course, marketers ruined it because <laughs> they're like, well, if you can lend credibility by linking to something, 
what if I gave you money and then you linked to it and I bought your credibility? Right. So that now, now we fast forward 23 years, and probably more than 23 years, where Google's like now understanding everything. And, and what people always forget is how smart Google yeah. is. Like we use Google all day and it's so smart and Google, like we rely on Gmail and we rely on all these things. And I used to live in the Bay Area where they have self-driving cars, which haven't hit anybody. Like they're really smart. They're using AI. You can't scam them with fake links. Right. So that, that's where like, Yes, 23 years ago, you could buy a link from, I think, even the New York Times sold it, yeah. because why not? Right. Right? <laughs> it's another revenue stream. <laughs> and, and, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and now fast forward, where like they're using AI to make decisions and they have like, you know, they, they can do, they, I think they have tools for diabetes to understand like all these things. The Fitbit now can tell you whether you're about to have a heart attack and Google owns Fitbit. Right. Like, all of these things. And you're like, oh, you think you're scammy link on that website. You're you know, going to get that, that pass. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It links to your, your law firm as well as it links to pet insurance and like a crypto scam. Like, not a chance. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, you, you know, Google's smart, but you are way smarter. You're going to just slide that one in under the door. <laughs> right. So that's why I wouldn't focus on those links because a lot of the, the companies that are selling those links, they're selling them on places that are willing to sell yeah. them. I would instead focus on PR. So if you win a great case. Yes. I think lawyers, from what I know about lawyers, yeah. they're good at getting PR. Yes. Make sure that the right media talks about you. Yeah. It doesn't need to be national media because you're not focused on the national media. Exactly. Audience. You don't want those national clients. Local media talks about you. And better yet, they they link to you. Yep. And if they're not going to link to you, and I, and I know like when it comes to SEO, they're always like, link to this exact page, these exact works. If a, a, if a newspaper, a local newspaper is too smart to link to your website because it's commercial, they're not going to link to your commercial website and recommend that people hire you. Get them the link to your LinkedIn oh. because the same thing happens. They're linking to you yes. as the lawyer. Now someone finds your LinkedIn and says, oh, I wonder what law firm that, that woman comes from. It's right there. And now yep. they find, right? So don't think of links as, I need to link to directly to this page, yeah. which has the content around me being a divorce attorney or DUI attorney. Just, I need to get a link to me. Yes. And that's all you need to accomplish. That's a great point. And, and also that goes back to recognizing how smart Google is. So basically what people are trying to do with those fake links and the purchase links and like the, the whole link strategy is to kind of outmaneuver Google, which is just not going to happen. But the goal is to have some link authority, which you can literally do correctly and validly by getting that PR. And so instead of putting all that money towards that kind of fake um, strategy that is probably not going to work and is, is also going to just look kind of scammy and, um, you know, be a, kind of a bad approach, go and you get the mileage with the PR and you get those great links. Totally. And again, thinking of SEO holistically, which is people using search engines to find something. Yeah. It doesn't matter what page shows up. So if someone's looking for Jane Doe, the DUI attorney, it doesn't matter whether they look and they find your LinkedIn at the top 10 results. Right. They find a YouTube video of your local, of your interview. They find your, your uh, college that you went to, your law school that you went to, talking about you and talking about the great things you do. You have 10 opportunities to show up for you. All of that is SEO. SEO is not showing up or I need to be number one for divorce attorney, which is almost impossible. Today. Yeah, that's a, yeah, that's so great and, and really valuable. And honestly, I feel like it, it relieves a little bit of the pressure because, you know, it's not so narrow, super hyper focused on, like you're saying, I need to show up for divorce attorney. It's just show up for you. And then, you know, the, that, and then it will follow. Like if you build uh, kind of campaign around you and you've got all these different methods of them finding you, then it, everything will follow from that. I think that's, that, yes. that's a relief kind of to hear that. And you also want to think of like how all your pieces fit together. So I'm in Houston. There's a specific lawyer in Houston, which he promotes himself as the personal injury attorney. He may be all across Texas and he's got the works. He's got radio ads. He's got TV ads. Now SEO should fit in that like, Oh, I heard this guy's TV ad. Oh, I heard his radio ad. I saw the billboard. Now, if I Google him, what do I find? Yes. Do I find a picture of smiling lawyers or do I find something that matches all of those other campaigns? That's the way SEO fits it together. Yeah. He has created people, a reason for people to search because they've heard all those other messages. Now, SEO should not get all the credit. That's a lot of money spent on all those other media. 
it all ties together. It's one big strategy. Yes. Yes. Okay. Awesome. So it's time for the book recommendation. Uh, I'm an avid reader. I read about a hundred books a year. And so, you know, find me on Goodreads, but, um, and our audience is full of lawyers who spend a lot of time reading as well. So what's a good book that is worth their time when they don't necessarily have all the time in the world to, um, you know, sit down with a mediocre book. So years ago, I read a book called Million Dollar Consultant. And this is a book written by someone who's been, I think he's just turned 80. Oh, His wow. name's Alan Weiss. And he wrote a book at 25 years ago uh, called Million Dollar Consultants about how you be a million dollar consultant. And lawyers are, are can also be million dollar consultants. Sure. Although he has a lot of negative things to say about lawyers <laughs> because of the way, the way they charge. Yeah. He thinks that people need to charge based on value and lawyers charge based on the hour. Yes. So it doesn't mean that you're stuck on that. You can listen to his advice. So I read this book a bunch of years ago and I pivoted the way I started doing consulting and I was moonlighting first and now I do it full time. So wealth of wisdom about really how to think of a consulting practice, how to think of adding value as a, as a consultant and how to charge for that value. Yeah. So totally recommend that book. He's written a number of books. I even hired him to be my coach. Just very unique in the way he thinks about consulting as an industry. Yeah. And honestly, I think there, there is a movement among lawyers to switch towards the flat fee service instead of the hourly based service. And, um, you know, I've had some other people that we've talked about this and it really is the way to, first of all, show value and kind of remove that trans trans, it, make the whole uh, interaction more transparent and because it is very confusing for people who have never hired a lawyer before to have any sense of, you know, what things are going to cost. But, um, but also it really is the way forward for, to, for most firms to show growth too, because if you are just, you know, you, you have a limited number of hours. And so that's always going to be a constraining factor if you're only ever billing for your hours. Um, so that sounds great. We will link to million dollar consultant on the show in the show notes and on the show page as well. Uh, also I want to mention that you have your book. So tell us the name and, um, tell us about your book. So my book is called product led SEO. Okay. The why behind organic growth strategy. So it started as I had this, these kinds of conversations when I had a full-time job and I was moonlighting on the side and I, I had this unique approach to SEO, which is many times don't do it. Yeah. Or if you're going to do it, really think about the user. And I was always asked, like, what do I learn more? What do I read more? And I didn't have anyone to put yeah. it. So I, I wrote the book. Nice. So really about how to think of SEO and why you should be thinking of SEO and how it all works rather than these are the 50 tactics to do. You must do this. Otherwise, your SEO is bad yeah. and you're not going to ever do well. <laughs> So that, that's the focus of my book. Awesome. But the other part of my book is really, I think of SEO from a product-led standpoint, which is I'm creating something, a, a widget that somebody's searching for because it's useful for that searcher. And this is something that some lawyers can think about. I would, for local lawyers, I wouldn't think about it at all. But think about like a Zillow. Yeah. So Zillow created a service specifically for someone that's using Google to find something, which is the value of their own home or the value of their neighbor's home. There is no other way to acquire that user. No one, they're not going to do paid advertising for the value of my home. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. How many people are looking? So that's something valuable for people using Google that they'll continue to use search. If someone is, if there's a lawyer out there that does service more of a, a national audience and there's something very specific that they do, that would be an opportunity to really take all of that and turn it into a product, a catalog, a glossary, a directory that people can access and learn from. And if you're the expert, the follow on will be that they'll contact you. Yes. When I think of product, it really has to be something scalable, which means you can't hire someone to write one piece of content and then another piece of content. Something more scalable, let's say stock prices, that's scalable. It's all take all the stocks and you feed in the data. If there's something like that, that you're an expert in, that would be a product and there might be a lot of search volume from there. But other than that, I would really only write content because you're investing in content, you're investing in SEO that will drive users and potential clients to you. Nice. Awesome. Okay. That's really bad. And we will obviously link to, to your book um, and and all of that on the show notes in the show page as well. So Eli, what? It's, my book is like, a, Amazon changes the price on it, <laughs> but I think right now it's $14. This, If you buy my book, it'll be the, the only $14 you'll ever have to spend on SEO <laughs> if, if I could give it to you not to do. Yeah. This will save you thousands, thousands of dollars. <laughs> It could be tens of thousands, depending on, exactly. you know, what, where, where your geographic location is. Um, yeah. So that could be a great investment for 
lot of these firms. Uh, Fire your SEO firm. You don't need that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, okay. So Eli, what's uh, one big takeaway that you'd like people to get from this episode? SEO is a marketing channel. Yeah. And you should just think of it as a way to acquire potential clients for you and not as something you have to do. This, It's this mysterious black box. No one understands it. The only people understand it is the firm you hired. And that's why you have to pay them thousands of dollars a month. It's a marketing channel. The same way you don't take ads out on the radio if you don't think your listeners, the listeners of the radio are going to become clients. Don't do SEO if there's not going to be potential clients from there. Oh, I love that. That is, uh, it seems such a fresh and rare perspective, but I have these conversations a lot with clients and it almost always results in a client where um, for some reason, it's just really not a good fit for them. And no one else has mentioned that. It's like, really, you know, I am not going to, I'm not going to be a snake oil, oil salesman. I'm not going to be the one who just comes in and tries to take your money. And then a year or two down the road, you're just mad at me uh, because it, you know, it didn't do what, it wasn't this miraculous golden ticket where all of a sudden you had the keys to Willy Wonka's factory. Um, you know, it, it, is not right for, for every firm. And so, uh, but it is definitely right for some firms. So figuring that out and making that definition before you jump in is really a critical piece of strategy that a lot of firms kind of just bypass. So that's great. That is such good information. And thank you so much for being here. This is, I think is going to be a kind of, like I said earlier, a light bulb moment for some firms where it's like, okay, maybe I can set that aside and use that money for something like, you know, a vacation or something else, you know, $14 for your exactly. book. <laughs> exactly. I, I think the big thing is if you have the wrong focus on metrics, so you may be mad at the SEO firm, but they can continuously point to, hey, we, this is the rankings we got. You. Right. And if you're not clued into like, well, that doesn't pay the bills, yeah. it's the clients that pay the bills, then you could be satisfied while well, I paid them. I don't know why I'm paying them, but they've done what they're supposed to do. Right. Do what you're supposed to do and then measure them on that. Yeah. And measure and make sure that that measurement matters. So, you know, yes. that you're not just ranking in the Ukraine for some, you know, thing like who cares? You don't have your clients there. You need to make sure that that measurement is something that actually results in revenue for your firm. So, all right. I will leave it there. Thanks again so much for being here. This was such a great conversation. Really appreciate having me. Thank you, Karen. Thank you for listening to this episode of the CouncilCast podcast. Be sure to visit our website at council-cast.com for the resources mentioned on the episode and to give us your feedback. If you enjoyed this episode, I would appreciate if you could rate and review the podcast on Apple and subscribe to your favorite podcast platform. See you on the next one.